Hi guys, I hope you'll excuse this quick and dirty video, but I know you found it helpful in the past for me to give you a few words of introduction before you dive into the reading for the week. And so I wanted to try to get you situated. So this week we're talking about social network analysis again. Last week we talked about it very pragmatically in terms of like how you would actually conduct social network analysis and we built simple network analysis graphs. This week we're looking at the ways in which the logic of network analysis has threaded itself into many of the ways that we now think about and experience the world. And in particular, network analysis has become part of the way that a lot of technologies make decisions. So the first um, reading that we look at, which is if everything is a network, nothing is a network, takes on that question of, wait, what are we doing in the first place? Like, why did we decide that network analysis was the way to understand the world when there are so many things it doesn't capture, like narrative and flow? And I think what Zeraviv is calling for is just a pause to say network analysis captures some things, but are we sure it captures everything that we actually care about? And then the second article that we look at in depth it has multiple authors, but it's about this problem of homophilic networks, which you learned about a tiny bit last week. So these are networks in which people are bound by shared likes or even dislikes. And what these researchers have found is really fascinating, that the case that purportedly demonstrated the fact that people will always get along better with people who share the same values that this this case w was deeply embedded in discussions about housing in the United States and even in the segregation of American cities. So this apparently common sense phrase, birds of a feather will flock together, seems like common sense, but in fact, its proof relies on some faulty assumptions about what people will actually choose. And the article is a fairly detailed exploration of the ways in which the results of that experiment were slightly skewed and reframed to suggest that all Americans want to be in close proximity to Americans who are just like them. So that's part of what the article does. And then a, a second part of what the article does is talk about some interesting tendencies of homophilic networks. So if you build a network with a small tolerance for difference, that is to say, if you build a network assuming that nodes will want to be close to nodes that are like them, it may seem relatively benign at the beginning. But as you build that network out and build that network out, it will become more and more segregated until you get to a, a point where you've gone from 100 to 1,000 nodes, and you can see that the segregation has increased to the point where triads that include people from multiple uh, persuasions have diminished significantly. So why does this matter? Why should we care about it? Actually, this notion of homophily is built deeply into a lot of the technology that we use today. Uh, if you think about the way that Spotify works, is it assumes that if you like the same music as someone else, then you'll probably like another piece of music as someone else. And of course, Facebook assumes that if you share a friend in common, then you'll probably like someone else on the social network. So homophily is critical to the way that many technologies and recommender systems make decisions about what to recommend. And yet, these researchers are showing it has roots that we didn't know about that are deeply embedded in American redlining practices. And it may not even be true in the first place. So as you're reading, there's a lot of detail in, in the article, as there should be, because they're really interested in making their case. But that's the major arc that you're looking for. We have this history 
they're uncovering and showing you about how the conventional wisdom came to be. And then they're showing you how there are certain problems with the way that was framed and communicated. So two things really this week. One is the limits of viewing entities or people or ideas as networks, what that captures, what that doesn't capture. And viewing networks as possessing certain qualities that could also be a problem because we haven't fully thought through the effects of what networks are doing when they recommend similar things to similar people. So that's where we are with social network analysis. Below this, you'll be reading about machine learning which has its own set of concerns, but they're not dissimilar in a lot of ways to the concerns of network analysis because they have to do with what kind of data we input into the algorithm, what the algorithm assumes about people's behavior, and then what it recommends at the end. So not unlike what a Spotify or Facebook recommender system does. So that's all. I think that's all that you need to bear in mind as you read. And I hope you'll come to class with lots of questions. Thanks.